I'd like to call the uh, meeting of the Public Works Commission to open for Wednesday, January um, 28, 2015. Um, first, we will have any public comment. Yes. Yes. You know, in the past, we talked about interdepartmental and inter enterprise fund swapping of employees and equipment. And today's Gazette, we've got a uh, Public Works Water Division returns to the garage after his snow plowing route. So I'm wondering if he's on a Department of Public Works truck, or he's on a Water Department truck, or is he on the Department of Works payroll, or is he on the Water Department payroll? He's on many of that. Public Works payroll. Has that been it's resolved on policy, or? It's not a policy. Or we were asked procedure. to factor for this year to see how much it was costing, that's what we're doing this year. How much is costing out of the enterprise fund? Because all the other time on snow and ice operations is paid out of the general fund. So it's strictly the take straight time and the equipment use. It would be used well, I don't, I, don't, I don't question that one. It's the, it's the during the daytime. It's the water, uh, water department employee is a member of the water enterprise fund. That's correct. And it seems like when you're taking them out of that position, putting them into a general fund position is the water department's paying for it. They currently are. We were asked to track that this year, and that's what we're doing. And one other thing that just crossed my mind is when you've got your, your new designation here, there's been all this talk about advisory position or advisory capacity. I'm wondering if the advisory shouldn't work the other way, that you should be getting advice from the department that would be of interest to the taxpayer rather than like questions I just asked. And in the past we had when you were doing contracts, I remember one of the gripes I had in the beginning was that we never knew where the money was coming from, which fund it was coming from. And now that you're not doing contracts, we don't even know where the money's being spent or how the money's being spent. So maybe there ought to be some sort of backwards communication from the department to the advisory commission on how money is being appropriated or where it's coming from or what it's being used for. So that people watching this on television have some idea of where their tax money is going. Thank you. And also, you know, we're continuing to discuss the role of the CPW with the DPW. I, that's tonight. why I brought this up. It's because Thank you. Jim, did you have anything more to say? I came because cause on the agenda uh, you were talking about uh, looking over contracts or talking about different contracts that you're going to do and there's one for the flood control station that I want to make a short comment on. Do you want to make it now? Or no, I'd rather that? wait until you're discussing it. Just no, if, no, 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 no. If that's agenda. Oh, you're not going to talk about that then? Let me talk yeah, about we're it now. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it on this DPW project thing. Oh, all right. Flow oh. chart. Oh. And will that that be under number one? Mm-hmm. Oh, got a new business. Okay, great. So, we want to talk about then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And thank you all for your comments. Um, the minutes for December 10th, 2014. Um, did you get comments back from anyone? From Mr. Parsons. Oh. Very small edits. Minor edits. I think I called them tiny. <laughs> tiny. <laughs> Don't change the context. I at all. added an S to over. <laughs> Thank well, you for sharing. Thank you. You can okay. have too many S's. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to know if we would, if we would if we'd like to make a motion to approve those minutes with the <clears throat> tiny corrections. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. New business. Discussion of DPW. So in your package tonight is this <coughs> colorful handout. This was uh, made by Jim and Dave Weber, our senior engineer. Basically, you had asked our Terry, I think specifically asked about going over projects that we currently have on the books. Um, uh, some of these projects are from FY14 and FY15 approvals on the capital side. So 
we'll just start at number one, which is pavement contract. This was actually the FY15 pavement contract, and this is one of the streets we weren't able to take on this past calendar year. This job will be taken off in the spring uh, by Warner Brothers when we start up again. We will be having a new pavement contract for reclaim and mill and overlay on various city streets. Uh, you can see the color flow chart that the green is design and development, the pink is bidding and contracts, and the blue is construction and implementation. Uh, we have that project going out. Um, if I recall right, it is about a 1.5 total of everything we're doing. It looks like it'll be about $1.5 million this year that we're doing between coal plane in place, reclaim, mill and override, override and rubberized chip seal. The reason why they're separate contracts is they're um, crack sealing is kind of specialized work, the rubberized chip seal is specialized work, and the coal plane and recycling is specialized work that the normal paving companies don't do. So that's why they're being bid and constructed separately rather than by one big master contract like we did this past year. So can I ask a quick question? Sure. In terms of the, um, it seems to me within the last month, six weeks, I read something about the city um, gaining an additional five hundred thousand um, uh, dollars to be used for for various road mm -hmm. projects, uh, and, and and I assume that's reflected in, in what we're looking at here. Um, that is actually money is released this year, not for next year. That is a FY sixteen or fifteen appropriation from the state and through the transportation bond bill. So that's to be used between now and, and the end of no, July uh, June. That money's ours. We have it. It's ours. We can use it next year. We can save it for the year okay. after. All right. So it's like tailings. What or something. I can't so, right. What I can't yeah. guarantee that it's going to happen next fiscal year that they're right. going to do the full three hundred million dollar bond bill. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So I guess, in, I'm just curious in terms of timing, whether that, and, and what is, it, is it fair to characterize that as an unexpected uh, bonus? Yes. Okay. So I'm just curious in terms of the uh, that circumstance and and the planning that we're talking about here relative to roads, which I which, um, I mean last year, I think everyone felt as though we got a lot more paving done citywide um, and, and reconstruction than, than we had in many years leading up to that mm -hmm. because of the circumstances. Is this putting us in a, in a better position to make a bigger dent in road construction or road paving, uh, re uh, reconstruction? Uh, I know that there's a lot of roads that are, that are listed on the deteriorated or deteriorating list that, that continue to be put off from year to year because of lack of funding. I'm just curious as to how much of a dent we're making in that uh, in that. It's not list. a huge dent because we have about a, if I recall right, um, last year we had I think a 36 million dollar backlog in paving operations. So it's making a dent but it's not 10 percent of it. It's right. you know, a few percent that we're making. Right. What we don't know is what the Capital Improvements Committee and the Mayor through the City Council is going to recommend for capital improvements this year. Mm -hmm. um, over the five-year plan, he looked at putting 500000 last year, which he did, right. and skipping a year going to a million, then skipping a year going to $1.5 million right. as capital improvements. I don't know what's going to happen this year with the new five-year plan, especially with the release of this 500000 Right. So am I to understand from that that that's a two-and-a-half-year, two-and-a-half-million-dollar debt and a $36 million project over, or deficit, if you will, over uh, a five-year period that you just described? Skipping, okay. having it, it's skipping a year. You got the 2.5 million from it. Uh, one and a half plus one plus plus oh, one and a half. Capital plus one improvements. For capital improvements. That's that's the capital improvements on top of the Chapter 90 funds that we receive. Okay. So there's a 10-year contract for Chapter 90 funds, and historically, what's happened is that they've only released uh, two-thirds of that. Right. They released a 200 million dollar bond bill versus a 300. And what? How much of that trickles down into that 36 million dollar deficit that we have? Um, usually we've been putting together about three quarters of a million dollars a year into paving contracts and the other money was used for hiring consulting engineers for intersection improvement projects like uh, designing Damon Road, right. Little <coughs> Park Roundabout, right. things like that. Okay, all I'm trying to get at here is, is as we're hearing these bits of information that come forward from uh, um, expected and unexpected sources, Chapter 90, 
not ever knowing how much that's going to be from year to year, even though there's a 10-year, I understand there's a, there's a plan to, to have that be incrementally uh, predictable over a 10-year period. How much of a debt at the end of a 10-year period, with knowing that we have that, uh, that we have a, uh, a tentative commitment, if you will, for that amount of money, are we going to make in that $36 million shortfall that we have? You're not. You're not going to make a dent because what's happening is that there's well, we're, one of the things we're focusing on now is roads that will use a mill and overlay or an overlay, mm -hmm. so they don't go into the reclaim, which right. greatly increase the cost of these roadways. But right. we know we have to take care of some of the backlogs of the reclaim roads. Right. So, as we're not putting money into mill and overlays, these streets are falling into a mm -hmm. fuller disrepair that is much more expensive to fix. Okay. So, so going back we're, we're not, mind, we're not I'm just trying to get to this so I can clear my foggy brain on it. I, I one of the things I brought up in the fall was the idea of trying to explore the possibility of bonding for roads, because I think that it's, I think it is a capital asset our roads, and I think that we have to. I don't really see the um, disadvantage of treating them as a as a, a benefit that we need to to uh, protect the same way we protect bu buildings that we build for police stations or fire stations or schools. And I think that if we continue to not make any headway in that $36 million road deficit that has been identified, and that we're only treading water in being able to address the annualized road needs by your description that you just gave me, it seems to me that we should in an advisory role, have some, begin to have some, uh, uh, bring forward a discussion to those who we might be advising and those who might be interested in our opinions about how we might better deal with that very important responsibility that lies right here with the Department of Public Works. Because we could have had this same conversation, it seems to me, 10 years pr prior to this or 20 years prior to that, and with people who are sitting here in our same roles and others who have held your responsibilities. We don't seem to make any significant headway on it, in it, and, it and it's all, it's all so, uh, it, it, it's, it's so unpredictable, you know. It's, uh, it seems to me that, that, that we ought to try to do something that, that uh, addresses that in a way that involves uh, some bonding. So if you look at the capital plan over the past eight, ten years, every year there's been in there pavement management. And I know for at least the past five to six years, I've ranged from between two to four million dollars a year with a five year plan of investing 15 to 20 million dollars back into streets. And last year was the first year we ever saw any funding from the city. Well, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you haven't lobbied for this right. actively, in, 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 in your, as have your predecessors. I'm just saying it's something that is, that is conveniently ignored uh, because it, it, uh, it by, uh, the community uh, without recognizing the, the the problems that that's that's uh, creating for us. I mean, th these costs of these roads continue to climb mm -hmm. at a rate that we'll never uh, be able to address in the manner that we are set up to address it. So it seems to me that we have to look at addressing it a different way. To uh, and it would I, I that's where the bond that you're I think the bond bonding bond bond that's where the capital improvements could have taken off. They the mayor could have made a recommendation to the city council, and the city council could have bonded four million dollars in a year, but they didn't. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. In, I, I think it needs a completely different perspective than that. I think that, need, that certainly that's where the, the responsibility ultimately lies. But I think in order to broaden the discussion, it has to be looked at in the context of what we want our roads to, how we want our roads to be able to perform for us as we go forward as a community. I mean, we're doing it. We're, we're addressing important needs such as with stormwater management. Very effectively, and we even though it, it, it was a community-wide debate, it was a it was an argument that was uh, well received by the community. I think in general because it was well presented. I don't think the roads are any different than that. You know, they're deteriorating just as the just as our stormwater management system has mm -hmm. been deteriorating over years. <coughs> but uh, and I and I don't know why it isn't up to us to to try to advocate for that. Uh, it would seem to me as though it might make some sense for us to at least consider it. And I'm just throwing it out to the to the group here because. Uh, you know, if it's advisory, it seems to me that's something we could advise on. Jim? I was just going to say that, um, you know, theoretically you can look at the condition of all the roads within the city and you can determine what, so if you can look at the amount that you invest in repairing the roads 
and you can determine whether you're falling, you're getting ahead. This is sort of your question. Are we gaining on it? Are we falling behind? Are we sort of breaking even on keeping the general state of the roads in Northampton? Are we keeping them in, are they getting better or worse or not the same? And BHP did an analysis for us a couple of years ago that looked at, you know, that sort of, it's like a big picture look, right? You look at the, the 36 million is like the condition of every street in Northampton, which to me, the, it's not a real number because, you know, I don't know, when, when are we going to pave every street in Northampton? I mean, if you look at the majority of streets that people drive, and, and even just the work that we did last year, people noticed a real significant change. So we're not making a big dent on the $36 million backlog or whatever the backlog is, but we're making a, a considerable dent in the lives of the people that drive the main roads within Northampton. I think <coughs> people are seeing improvements. I think we're pretty proud of those improvements. But to get to get back to your question, the, the amount that we should be investing, you could look at doing a, a, an analysis to determine theoretically what what's that amount that we need to spend every year to, to sort of keep up with it. I don't actually remember what the number was a couple of years ago. No, but BHP, you did. BHP did a report for us. I think Ned may have sent it around to the board, but the point is an important one because if you have money in capital improvements or you look at the money we get from Chapter 90 or you look at whatever our, our, our bucket of money is for paving streets, you have to look at it and, and ask the question that you're asking. And if we need more, if it's bonding or something else, then hopefully there can be a more intelligent conversation about how much money do we have and how are we, are we gaining on it? I mean, I think it's a really good question. I can't tell you tonight if we're gaining on it, but what B, what BHP has done that sort of financial analysis that says, you know, if you continue to invest only this amount, then the roads within the city are going to continue to degrade and you'll never catch up. Mm -hmm. If you invest a little bit more, then you'll start to see that you're going to gain on the overall condition of the roads within the city. Kind of an important number, because otherwise you take what you get and you spend it and yeah. And that sort of Which thing. is pretty much the way we've operated as a city for a long time. Mm -hmm. the, the department has only had access to whatever uh, money has been made available through the various sources that it uh, appears, such as the 500 million that the, or the 500 thousand that we got uh, uh, six weeks ago. But it, it's it's that sporadic availability of money to deal with the problem that makes it hard. It seems to me to plan in any intelligent way for something that will will deal in a in, in a uh, w with a, a, a more uh, long-range view towards uh, uh, addressing our, our requirements that we have for uh, roads throughout the city, and and I think the reason that the that all of the work that was done last year on the roads was so well received is because the frame of reference that people had, including myself, up at that time was for much less to be done. This seemed like a lot was being done, and everybody was happy about it, particularly after the harsh winter that occurred a year ago when all of the problems that were created with that. So, you know, that may very well end up, it always has been the nature of DPW work in the, in the city and that's how it's been dealt with. But I'm just looking at it from a different perspective saying, I think we ought to take a broader view of it. And I think it's something that might very well give us as an advisory board something to help uh, alert the community about in a way that would, you know, um, provoke some discussion at the very least. You know, the, the bonding, the way the bonding works, and in, in my experience with it, is that there's bonds that expire over time, and, and the impact on the taxpayer, if properly planned, for new bonding to replace that can not be, will not necessarily be felt in the, in the, uh, in the, in the tax rate. So something as sophisticated as a need to deal with, with roads over a longer period of time will involve a lot of money. It's the equivalent, in every, to every extent, of building uh, an important building. But these are important assets for the community and need to be treated that way, rather than given secondhand uh, treatment the way that they are financially if the money's available. So I, I, I think this is a great topic. I mean, I think we've looked at our roads and we've seen them; they're in tough shape. And and the work we did, the work we did was was excellent, but. Um, I think the analysis that Jim talks about is a tool that we absolutely need before yeah. we go any further yeah. mm -hmm. because it, otherwise our discussion is all qualitative and and I, th I think we'll be surprised at the amount of money that we need to spend each year mm -hmm. to maintain status quo or perhaps catch up a little bit and I suspect that we're going to be disappointed that what we spent last year Although, which was a whole bunch, which was a lot of money, isn't enough, yeah, and that right. was a great year. Right. Yeah. And, but I, 
but we can't have the we can't have a meaningful discussion without that kind of yeah that's background. absolutely right mm -hmm. i just used the 36 million because it was a number that, no, no, that, that yeah. threw out i don't know what i have any idea what it is i have a, i have another thought and it re actually relates to the next item on the agenda and and maybe we can wait till then but it's not at all clear to me whether this commission and 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 it relates to Dick's comment whether this commission takes assignments from the administration where they want the advice or whether we should be initiating and and that goes back to my question last well, that's, week which that's right. was are we re representing the voters or the city of Northampton yeah. community who are we representing and, and I've reached a conclusion I don't know if it's the right one. And I think yeah. we take assignments that are given to us. I think that's what an advisory board does. Yeah. And it's clear to me that that's what the change was. Right. So we need to get that clarified because if the administration, and it goes beyond the staff here, doesn't want us dealing with this yeah. issue, yeah. then the staff really shouldn't be spending their time yeah. answering this question for us. And right. so we're going to spin our wheels a little bit here until we get a real understanding of what we should be doing here. Well, you know, and it, and it actually stops, the, the, it starts at, the, at a level above even Ned and, and Jim. It starts with the mayor being uh, comfortable with what his expectations are from this department, which now answers directly to him mm -hmm. in a way that uh, there's really been no precedent for. So he has to be clear, and maybe he's been, I don't doubt that he hasn't been, been, been uh, ex extremely clear, clear to you guys already, but as that, as that responsibility comes downward in a, in in a, in, a uh, uh, in in the in terms of uh, authority and responsibility, it then will provide some clear, I think, idea of what is expected out of us. And as we flounder around and have this on our, our our agenda for the fourth month in a row here, trying to still figure out what it is that we're right. supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it, I'm I'm curious about it because it, it's you know it's uh, it's something that it sounded to me listening to. To you guys uh, explaining how, as we were kind of um, in our last meetings there, explaining how you saw it happening as being helpful to you. And at the end of the day, I think that's important because, you know, that's if we're advising, we have to be able to know what to advise and be able to be, if it can provide help to you and insight to you guys in terms of what we're seeing out there, then that's good. Um, that should be able to work. It's a lot different than how we've acted in the past. And I think that's to Mike's point. I mean, I'm not sure. You know, any of us, if we were to jot down what we thought we would, our responsibility was as five different people here at the table, they would be very dissimilar. And it's because we're, we don't really know. So I, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm suggesting is maybe there, there's a clear indication of how, it, how the expect, how the, the mayor expects his relationship to you, to, to this department to be uh, handled and how he subsequently feels that that responsibility in the advisory, that responsibility on the department level to the advisory commission such as ourselves needs to be handled because the whole idea of the charter change is to give that kind of uh, uniform responsibility from the top down, organizational chart wise and everything else. And we're in here in a kind of a floating around in, a, in an undefined area. So I, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't be talking about roads. <laughs> maybe you guys should be telling us what your plans are for roads. But I think your point is certainly well taken. We got to be able to qualify what we're talking about right. in terms of real dollars, because this could all be, you know, if it's if it's 360 rather than 36 million dollars worth of, of deferred or if, road problems, or if it takes it's a whole altogether different thing. That wouldn't even be something the city could consider. Or maybe we need to spend four million dollars a year instead of two. Yeah, something like that. Well, I don't, what I don't know what the numbers are. That I'm can happen through a bond. Yeah. Um, and, and I think all this is relevant to the next item on the agenda, but... We haven't finished this one. We have, yeah. We haven't finished this one. I had a question about this. Sorry. Done. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so, remember when you handed out the list of um, streets and what you were doing to each one for last year, last mm -hmm. fiscal year? So is all that... Is this new streets and new fiscal year? This is new streets for next year. Okay, great. So I guess one of my questions is, can we get a similar document for this year showing which streets yep. for each one? Because for me, that was really helpful to understand the process 
And in that, Pat, we got a def you may understand this, but I didn't, what the different um, definitions of the different kind of road treatment was and why certain roads were allocated for certain kinds of, of use. But it was there, and it was easy to see. And we also got a spreadsheet, I think, on what streets and how long they've been on the list or something. Am I making that up? Am I? I could have a foggy on them. Anyway, um, anyway, that would, to me that was really helpful. So this, you, we can consider all the roads that you had told us about last year completed, and this is for the new fiscal year. Except for item one, which is a leftover. Like yes, yes that, and that's what you yeah. said. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it, it's all the planning done on that we just had not didn't get to. That's the lower end of Bridge Road, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's um, from yeah. Francis down from to where Jackson. It was done, yeah, yeah. Any more questions or, or can Ned continue? Okay. So the next one outside of Pavin is item number six, which is Pine Street, Florence Road, River Bank, Winslow Water Mains. A uh, combination of things. We've had Pine Street in the works for a couple of years with um, getting the water line out of the river, the Mill River, and getting it into the utility bay on the bridge. With that, there's associated work on Florence Road that needs to be done too. In fact, um, this contract was just recently awarded to Gonzales for about $670,000. Um, <clears throat> Winslow uh, Water Main was part of the Tate and Howard um, uh, uh, streets that they uh, was under capacity they wanted upgrades to. And Riverbank, we've had a number of breaks on that AC main over the years, so we're just going to replace it with a ductile iron main. <clears throat> Country Roundabout, uh, we've provided 100% comments to the state at this point. That project, my understanding, is going to be out to bid at some point early this year for spring construction, hopefully. Um, this is a project funded and paid for by MassDOT, except the water, which will be a non-participating cost agreement. We had Ty and Bond do the design work for that particular section of the project. So hopefully by the end of 2016, that project will be completed. Industrial park sewer replacement. Uh, this is something that we've been saving up for and transferred out of our sewer enterprise fund. Um, that's actually up to bid today. So that project will get done this, will be done this spring also. Uh, we'll start this spring, I should say. Uh, Connecticut River Levee uh, Repair Design Permitting. Uh, last year we, we put out a contract for the Mill River for the same type of work, maintenance work of clearing brush and debris and managing that channel, that diversion channel a little better. This is the same thing that's going to happen on the Connecticut River levee, removal of overgrowth, uh, uh, perhaps telephone pole or two that are in the levee system that need to come out by the Army Corps. <coughs> that nature. Basically doing some maintenance work that the Army Corps has requested. Hinkley Street reconstruction or is ongoing could, part? Could I interrupt you? Yes. So, um, some of these projects overlap fiscal years. So, if we show the project in in this current fiscal year, FY15, and construction in FY15, there's money already set aside for that project. Yes. Is that the way it works? Yes. So, at some point. Are we looking at projects where we need to worry about funding in the next budget years? Is that? That will be part of our budget conversations. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry. Keep going. That's okay. <laughs> yep. Um, next was Hinkley Street reconstruction. Uh, they're working on design of that right now and working on a drainage easement with um, uh, one of the property owners along the Mill River. Um, Warner Street sewer replacement. Um, while doing investigation work out there along Hinkley, we discovered that Warner Street sewer is in need of immediate replacement. It's crushed, it's ready to collapse. Uh, we had money in our sewer line replacement account, so we moved that one forward. Ty and Bond is actually designing that for us as we speak. Um, deep sewer drainage repair and on call services. This is a contract that we've been finalized over the past year or so about um, trying to hire a contractor in advance to take care of deep cuts of sewer lines, sewer breaks that we can't physically do. Every time we have one of these, the contractors come back with exorbitant prices because we're in a crisis mode, emergency mode. 
So we're putting out this contract for miscellaneous projects that we have across the city that we know we need to repair and for future repairs. And that way, hopefully, we get a better cost on that going forward. And that way, we also have a contractor ready to go instead of starting from scratch with procurement of emergency services. Uh, Plosky Park, I'll let Jim speak if you have any questions on that. We, uh, we got a, a state park grant um, which is providing $400,000 with the funding for phase one construction for the park renovation. We have a, a CPA grant application which will be pending in this round for the balance of the construction funding necessary for this, for, for, um, for the project. So at this point we're looking at um, construction starting um, near the beginning of the next fiscal year using those monies for the renovation of, um, of the park. Um, the project is proceeding in, in two phases, with the, the second phase being that overlook expansion that we've talked about. So um, there's sort of a shortfall in funding for the overlook construction of the overlook expansion. Is that cantilevered into the bank somehow? No cantilever. We're looking at sort of um, reducing the slope <coughs> and pushing the back of the park into the roundhouse lot oh. to make it more usable. Yeah. Yeah. So it's increased the the cost of the project and we'll be trying to get um, additional state funding to pay for that. But um, the renovation of the park as it stands right now is um, provided we get the CPA money to be moving forward this summer. And is the state money using from the grant money using? We found out about that back in the fall. Oh, okay. So, I mean, it's, it's great. Okay. <coughs> cool. That include the clock? It does include the clock. Clock needs to be wound up by here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can ask Wayne whether he's going to stop in every morning on the way to his office. And <laughs> Turn the big key. Yeah. Uh, so they're putting it up at the park, not down where it used to be historically? Yes. Uh -huh. oh. <coughs> so we can find next. The next is uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <was> item 14. <laughs> item 14, which is a generator for the low lift pump station at Mountain Street Reservoir. This was funded, I believe, two years ago through our OOM, or capital side of the water department. Uh, that's being designed right now, and um, hopefully will be fully constructed this year. Number 15 is the Upper Roberts Dam Removal Project that um, we've been working on for a number of years. As you know, in pre previous budgets, uh, we had set aside $1.3 million for decommissioning that particular reservoir system, or that dam, that is. We still have a pending million dollar uh, reimbursement from FEMA that's being reviewed. Uh, Jim and I were on a conference call about a week ago, a week and a half ago on that, and we're awaiting some information from GZA, our consultant, to be able to answer questions that FEMA has asked on, on that project. But the million dollars is pretty solid. This isn't still a question. Or is it a question? It is, it is a question. Yeah. We have money in our budget to pay for this, so this project is going to move forward regardless because we have money. We have enterprise fund money to pay for it. We're still trying to get the million bucks from, uh, from MEMA, and MEMA and FEMA on it. Um, the schedule that we've shown here, the schedule is a little bit in flux. There's been a, um, there's been a series of changes in, in state regulations related to um, what they're now calling el ecological restoration projects. Before it was a dam removal project and everybody was upset about adverse impacts to the environment because we were removing a dam and then all the regs get rewritten. And now our dam removal project is an ecological restoration <coughs> project which is being viewed in favorable light by the regulators. Um, so there's still a few things that are up in the air relative to that. There's some time of year things that are being discussed in terms of um, normally, if you're going to be working in a stream, they want you to be doing it in the summertime when flows are low. But when you're removing a dam, there's some benefit to trying to remove the dam when the flows are high so you can get some flushing of sediment and movement of sediment. So there's a few things. I'm not sure exactly how those are going to shake out, but if there are um, early spring requirements for some of the dam removal, I'm not sure if we're going to have the permits in time to hit the spring this year. So there's a, some of it's a little bit um, up in the air still. And then the, there's another part on the historical uh, aspects of the dam and some agreements um, 
that are going to need to be signed with the Army Corps of Engineers and Mass Historical and the Northampton Historic Commission about mitigation for removal of this historic structure in terms of what we're going to do to, to honor the removal of the dam. So we're working on um, some of those things and those I think will fall into place in time so to not to slow the project up. But when I put the blocks in for this one, we thought we'd be ready for the spring and now I'm doubting whether we're going to be ready and with those time of year restrictions it's not clear what the regulators um, you know somebody some tell us it's better when it's dry and others are telling us it's far better when it's wet so um, when all the arm wrestling's done I guess we'll know but um, we were trying to move ahead uh, to try to get the, the dam taken down this summer was really what, what our goal was and whether we achieve that I guess we'll, we'll wait and see uh, number 16 was River Road, Robert Meadow retaining walls. These are the two FEMA projects that we had reimbursables for 75%. Some of it was funded by the general side, the other part was funded by the water department. Uh, those projects are in design and working through permitting as we speak, just so you know that. Wastewater Sled Processing Building. <coughs> this is the thickener work that was approved as part of the FY15. There's a $550,000 capital line item for that work to be done. Uh, Jim is currently working on an RFP for that to go out on the street for uh, hiring a consultant. It has to be a Chapter 149 project, which we have to do the design and selection board for that. Uh, number 18 is wastewater plant pump stations, uh, communications electrical. This is what was approved for about $650,000 in FY14. That's currently under design with Woodward and Kern, and we're hoping to have that project completed by the end of the summer or so. Uh, this has had to do with uh, all the water coming into the control gallery, uh, uh, not the control gallery, but the uh, pump gallery on the bottom floor of the control building, they're coming up through electrical outlets, coming out through conduits and so on. And there's also a concern of making sure we have proper communications from the, um, the pump stations and alarm systems. Uh, they're working on that and the intercom system to communicate amongst personnel down there, which has failed for a number of years. Uh, traffic signals, 19. This is projects being funded by capital improvements of the city, CDBG money, and some Chapter 90 funds. Uh, one is the JFK school with uh, going to flashing school signs up there, and hopefully this year they'll fund a pedestrian activated crossing like we have on in front of the high school and down on Con Street one of the rapid, rapid flashing beacons there, uh, mainly because um, with the all the activity, it's not just during school time, but it's on weekends, it's at night time, it's all times of day people are crossing down by Birch Lane to get across to JFK School. That's why we're looking for um, extra money this year from capital improvements for uh, doing the, uh, the beacon, the flashing beacon for pedestrians. It's all those old people at Fair Hill. There you go. Uh, Main Street left turn as you're going, um, it would be going westbound coming up from Fitzwillies up to the light. Right now, uh, Main Street eastbound and on the leftbound on the King Street, get an advanced screen and everybody waits. This would provide at least two or three cars turning to go down Pleasant Street when the King Street light turns green to turn. Right? So, that for that project is for that be part of our chapter 90 funds going towards that. And the last part was audible pet pedestrian signals down by Old South, New South Street. Uh, we've had a number of requests down there and CWG money has decided they were going to fund that part, that part of that project. So that when, as you're coming up to the crosswalk you can actually hear the beeping noise that you're getting closer and you push it will have an audible sound for crossing then too. They have those down at uh, yeah, the courthouse, right? That, that they're beeping? Signals down there, audible signals? Mm. Well, no, there's oh, bird down there. used to be Tweets are going to help. Yeah. Difference. Tweet, tweet. Yeah, what about the Stop and shop intersection has. No, no, I'm, talking no. About, I'm talking about down at King the Street, corner Main of uh, King Street, Main Street. That's a cuckoo. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's not an audible. That's actually by the pedestrian it itself. So it's audible, right? I mean, it's audible. Different, yeah, it's, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like your iPhone. So you have a different yeah. chirp on it. Uh, King Street Brook Channel uh, culvert. This is a study being done by CDM Smith as, as we speak on this. Um, if you'd like to know more about it, Jim would have all the answers for that. Can do that. Uh, is it, is it result? 
of the flooding last year? It is. Okay. So it's the next it's the next okay. phase of this project that we're interested in moving forward on. Uh, CDM had done a uh, a fairly inexpensive model for us that showed that the uh, the culvert that goes under the bike path is is not big enough. It passes, I, I think, like a <coughs> not even a ten year storm or something. It's it's really not. Yeah. It's not big enough. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that need to be evaluated in terms of um, being able to get more water under that bike path. So it ends up being extremely complicated, of course, um, because if we push more water under the bike path into a marsh, then you have to know what the impacts of that water are. So you move more water, then if it's not going down Church Street, flooding people out it's going under the bike path, where does it go, and does it, does it impact anybody? Um, so when you start to look at the whole project, it becomes fairly complicated because it's looking at, looking at the brook uh, upstream of the bike path, then what happens within the marsh itself, and then what happens when the water goes into Barrett Street, down a, a sort of a canal down there, and then it goes under CVS, under King Street, under the Route 91, uh, the railroad, and then under Route 91, and ultimately down by River Run, it discharges to the Connecticut River. So one of the things that that I've asked for is a hydraulic model that shows us basically what's happening in the soil drainage system. Um, there's a tremendous amount of water being dealt. It's one of the largest drainage areas in the city. We really know nothing about it. So we're trying to look at. Um, the changes we need we need the model we need uh, topographic plan resource area delineations wetlands and other resource areas so if we change something we know what the impacts of that change are and we need to know the impacts of the change when we're going to get permits to do whatever we do there's a couple of really large beaver dams in Barrett Street Marsh that we want to remove uh, to basically improve some of the flow that goes through that marsh and at this point that'll that'll present a fair amount of change to that environment, so we need to have a better understanding of what the limits of the Beaver Dam are and what the, the resource areas are there. So there's a lot of things that we're looking at, and we're also um, putting a lot of thought into how we deal with beaver out there, um, because if we do all this work, we don't really want beaver in, in the Barrett Street Marsh, so, and we don't really want to trap them and kill them. So we want to prevent them from getting up into the marsh. So we're looking at ways of putting um, a flap valve or something on some of the large culverts closer to the Connecticut River so that we can keep them from crawling. Because they come up the culvert up into the marsh, they travel quite a distance. So the idea, the idea is to keep them from getting into the, into the big box culvert. So that's something that we're looking at as well. But I've asked CDM for a proposal, and I think we'll be getting something from them later this week or early next week on it. But um, it's a really, I tried to break it down to see if there were ways that we could not look at the whole thing because it's so, it's so large. And it's a little mind boggling when you look at everything that's been going on through the years. Um, but I think we have a good direction in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. And the idea here is to get a lot of this. Um, sort of existing conditions worked on so we can figure out how to move ahead. And, um, and initially when you were doing the analysis, was this, there was a determination that there weren't beavers, and, but then later on, didn't I see something that there were beavers? Uh, we actually trapped one beaver. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. there was some activity out there late in the fall, which was causing us uh, a considerable amount of concern about potential flooding. Um, so we did some trapping within the legal trapping season. We did trap one beaver, um, and we haven't seen any other activity. So I'm hoping that uh, we don't have a large population out there that we'll need to deal with. But we want to take steps to prevent, you know, further beaver from moving upstream from the from the Connecticut River up into the marsh. It's just something that doesn't it doesn't match well with keeping flooding. Um, keeping flooding out from the neighborhood. So. Yeah, I can remember when Carlin Drive was being constructed and the fire new uh, uh, fire department building was being built, fire station. Um, there was a, 
a lot of concern expressed about the uh, about the impact on the uh, on the Baird Street Brook and it, and and the, and the I can remember pictures on the front page of, of uh, the Gazette that, that showed the you know what the what the beavers had done and there was uh, there's a lot of beaver support in this community mm -hmm. so you might not be surprised to hear at least it was then and I don't know where it's gone still is has it yeah gone, has it gone anywhere so I mean that's that's a, it's kind of a that's another challenge to try to come up with a reasonable solution to uh, uh, for the whole problem. I mean, it's, cause it's not not everybody thinks that it's it's the problem that we should be concerned about. Uh, it turns out that it is. Um, trying to deal with the, the beaver in a, in a humane way is is as big of a problem as everything else because yeah. if we allow them to to reside in the Barrett Street Marsh, then flooding will happen. Nobody wants the flooding to happen. I don't particularly want to be out there trapping beaver all year, year long. It's mm -hmm. not really a sustainable approach to dealing with drainage in the city, so. I think there was a study done at that time uh, that showed the impact of the beaver on the uh, Barrett Street Brook, uh, the uh, an expanded area that had that had developed as a result of the, of the beavers' activity, and and so I'm, I'm you know it certainly is creating creating an even greater challenge. It would seem to me to sort through that problem as long as you have to recognize that they're there and uh, and have. Uh, We're going to start with them not there because mm -hmm. we can't have them there. So mm -hmm. that that's basically where we have to begin. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at removing them, which I think we have. I know there's not a large population. There may not be any population now, but the idea is to, <coughs> one of the first things that I think we would need to do is, is to try to implement a strategy to keep them from getting in. Yeah. And then look at what we need to do within the marsh to clear it out and get drainage through there. Um, the water level's high in the marsh, as, as you would know. Um, and it's, and it, it causes all sorts of problems <coughs> in all the abutting lands in, uh -huh. in, in different ways. Yeah. So it's um, you know it's not it's not as alarming as the Church Street State Street flooding that that's recurred over time um, because we don't have a lot of people yelling, but there were um, stormwater facilities that were built on Carlin Drive that don't really function at all. But flooding is not occurring because of it. You're just not getting the treatment of the water through those systems because yeah, they don't. And they were required to be built. They were, mm. and they would probably work if there wasn't a lot of water in the marsh. Mm. But there's a lot of water in the marsh, so yeah. those things don't really work well. And the battery of the water's backed up. Yeah. So it's complicated. Mm. I am. Um, we don't have a ton of money to work on this. We have a little bit of money in the stormwater utility for engineering. Um, I was interested in pricing. This is really what we need to do, and I'm curious to see how much it comes in because we can't do anything without looking at it as a system. Um, so it's important, but we'll keep picking away at it. Item 21, flood control pump station evaluation. Uh, we're working on an RFP to go up for that also. Basically, it's the evaluation of the building, whether or not it's feasible going forward in the future, what we can we can't do with it. Try to get a better idea of whether or not this is a, a retrofit inside an existing building or it's a whole new pump facility down the road uh, from now. That's being paid out of the stormwater utility. Uh, and uh, and this, these are the pumps in by the dike or in the dike. Yes. That's correct. Right. The big pumps. So what I've been doing, this is tied to... Um, and that doesn't mind me jumping in. Not at all. 21 and 22 are are, are related to uh, the Army Corps deficiencies that we've been getting in, in periodic and annual inspection reports from them. And I've been working on these RFPs for these two projects, and I haven't been able to get them out. I wanted to have them out sooner than now, and I haven't been able to finish. Um, these systems are quite complicated, and trying to get it, all of it, the scope of work described in an intelligent fashion so we can get proposals from people is, is a time-consuming task. Um, I've spent more time on the levy analysis and I'm almost done with that. Um, I had one of the engineers in engineering start to put together something on the flood control pump station which is probably more complicated than the levies even. Um, 
But she has left me with a draft, uh, one of the engineers has, and um, Jim Dostal has been kind enough, and there's Jim, to review a draft of the uh, of their que uh, request for proposals once I have a draft um, to get his insight and, and, and to take a look at it. And basically, um, what we have here is we have a lot of comments from the core about the pump station and the things that need to be upgraded. And we had a brief review that CDM did a couple of years ago in the stormwater utility study, that master plan study they did for us. In that report, they were recommending replacement of the station. And the core is not telling us to replace the station, but if you do this sort of work, um, you find that when you start trying to do upgrades for something this old and you have to deal with code compliance uh, issues and, and other things that come up, you're probably going to end up with a need for a new station. But the RFP that we're going to be putting together is going to start with how do we just deal with the cores, the issues that they're saying are deficient? Because we need to be able to we need to be able to address the deficiencies. Um, I'm not in a big hurry myself to spend money on a new station because it's really really expensive. So I think we want to see if there's a way to keep the system operational and functional in a safe um, in a safe reliable way that we can do without re without building a new one. But this study is going to go on to have them look at. Um, the potential for a new station, what the cost of that would be, because we're looking for opinion, someone's professional opinion that does this about whether we can reasonably address the core's comments about the pump station just by doing project, just doing upgrade projects within the current building, or whether we rapidly reach the point where we need to um, we need to build a new station, which is what they which is what CDM was recommending to us earlier. They were suggesting that you know we all, we we spent some time looking at this and it's stations in, in need of replacement. Um, so it's a big, big question and we wouldn't jump to the most expensive solution without seeing if there were any other reasonably cost-effective solutions that would provide us with a reliable station. Um, but that, that'll be a, you know, a pretty complicated project. Did you want to say something, Jerry? Yeah, I do. Uh, just a little history. Back in 1940, the Army Corps of Engineers gave us that station. They built it, they funded it, and they gave it to the city to maintain. And we did. It's over 70 years old, and it's worn out. But some of the things I think that they're asking us to do are way beyond what we should even be considering. And one of those is they're looking at us and asking us to do a study on the levees to see if they're high enough. Well, in order to do that, you've got to go all the way back to the Canadian border and find out what's coming out to do a true study, to find out what has happened on the Connecticut River from the Canadian border on down to the city of North End. That is not a city job. That's a federal government job in the Army Corps of Engineers. And I think that this commission should get as political as it can get to our senators, our representatives, and kind of push them for funding to have this done. I, it's crazy to ask us, because once we do it, it's a benefit for every community along the river that has any kind of flood control. Mike, you're, you know about these things. Mm -hmm. Am I talking a true... If that's what they're asking for, then you're right. Yeah. You're right. They're asking us to see if the dikes are high enough. It's crazy. And that's part of what we have to do. So I think the commission has got to get political. You've got to go to your senators, to your representatives, and to get them... Could you repeat that, Jim? <laughs> I think you've got to go to your senators and your representatives to get the Army Corps of Engineers to 
fund this study if they want it done. It shouldn't be with the city of Northampton. Uh, David, then. Um, I, I ran across this is many months ago a study on, uh, on the internet that, that had to do with a Connecticut community somewhere in the vicinity of Hartford, down downstream, but not too far downstream, regarding the flooding potential of the Connecticut River. And, and what this study said, and, and I'm sure that's part of the Army Corps bailiwick, what it showed was there are something like 50, you know, a sizable number of retention facilities that have been built in the 70 years since the major flooding, 36 and 38, and, and that the combi combination of, of this large number of retention projects has cut, the, cut the substantially the flooding potential of the river, not increased it, but reduced it. You're absolutely right. And, and, and of course, the counterpart to that is the climatic change and the, and the extreme events that we can anticipate. That's exactly right. And what, what's happened uh, since the atomic plant has come, to come off of? Uh, are, are they running those reservoirs up there? They used to pump up into one of the reservoirs and hold the water there? Well, that's still the cool. North Mountain. Yeah. You know, that's still operating, I believe. They're, they're also talking about raising the, uh, well, how much water they're pumping up to there. So there's a higher amount of water that's being pumped up. About increasing the but that, this is just that one and several others to find out, you know, exactly what's going on. If that study's been done and we can piggyback on that, then it's meant less money. Oh yeah. But your one's been done. You know, we shouldn't be spending our money to do it. No, it's, it's a gigantic regional project. It's That's more, exactly more right. That's right. So you know, are they imposing the same requirements? Does anyone know? on other communities who may have um, uh, similar buildings built 70 years ago when, when all of them were, were built? I mean, are we the only ones that have this have these broad uh, responsibilities with respect to the heights of the levees, or is this something that's common from community to community with their RFPs and so forth? anybody with a levee is getting, getting asked to do the same they're thing. They're getting asked either by FEMA or from the Army Corps right. to take a look at these things. So J Jim says that they are ignoring the federal agencies and the federal government is ignoring its responsibility to step up and fund this and try and dish it off on the communities that are affected. Is That's that right. basically what it is? So we probably ought to start with our our congressman. Uh, I would imagine he'd uh, be interested to know that. I haven't raised the issue yet, um, in part because I don't know how big of an issue it is. Um, <coughs> there are some river models that exist that, that we may be able to use. Um, I haven't quite gotten to the bo bottom of what our, what they're asking the city to do and what our obligation would be. I did speak with one consultant uh, that was working with Hadley recently, and when I ran into him, he was, he was indicating that there was updated river model information um, available for the Connecticut River. So what Jim's saying is definitely right. They are asking us to consider the implications of the river today and the height of our levees <coughs> today. So it's a big question. Um, but the reason that I haven't uh, started screaming yet is I, I don't really know exactly what amount of information is available and what our obligation would be to answer that question. Um, we do need to do a survey of our levees to determine whether the, uh, the elevation of the levees today um, matches or meets the design elevations from the, the late 30s when the design plans were done. So there's a lot of confirmation sort of work, existing, existing conditions work that we need to do. But Jim's right because it's sort of getting, it's going, it's starting to go down the road of, you know, they built something for the city a long time ago and the questions are sort of coming like, is it suitable, is it providing suitable protection for the city today? Now there's another aspect of it on the pump station side, which is all the, all the water that drains from the city to the pump station that we need to pump out in a big rainstorm. The question is, are those pumps adequately sized 
to handle all that water. Now, uh, my favorite engineer, Dave Shear, did an analysis and brought it to my office, and, and David tells me there's no way that those pumps are big enough nowadays. And he, 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 may, he may be right for a severe event like Irene or something if we get a lot more rain. We, we, we miss that storm. But if we got a huge rain event, those pumps might not even be big enough. And that's, that again is a question that the, that the core is asking us, and it gets down the reason why that one's important, and if we get mad, this would be a, this would be a good one to get mad about, because if they ask about this, so even if we could keep the pumps, if they're not big enough, they don't do us any good. So if we do that analysis and we find out that the pumps that they provided us with in 1940 aren't big enough, they don't have adequate capacity, then we have a gripe <coughs> at that point, I think, because we have a you know you have a facility that would cost tens of millions of dollars to replace that's the current facility is inadequate to meet the needs of the city. So what are our obligations? As Jim indicated, our obligation was to maintain what we have. What is it? Is it, is it the city's obligation to replace it to a bigger capacity? I mean, and those are, those are like the really good questions, because you, you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, and I feel no like... way around millions of dollars. Right. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot of money. And, you know, based on you know, to replace the pump station is beyond the there's two million bucks a year in that stormwater and flood control utility. If you replace the pump station, <laughs> that utility is not large enough to fund a project that's that big. Yeah. Unless unless the rates go you know, they go really high really quickly to do it. So at that point you'd have to start you would want to start looking for sources of of funding. And there aren't grant programs for this, so I think what Jim's saying is you know, getting in touch with with the city's legislators and and that sort of thing is really what needs is really what needs to be done. I mean, no one wants to wake up one day and, and say, "Oh boy, we have a 15 million dollar pump station project," or whatever the number would be. Where's that money come from in a city that our size? I think 50 million dollars is is just a, a lowball figure. <coughs> I think to replace that station, you're talking 30 million or better. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think the number I had in the back of my head was about 20, but I mean, these are just, I mean, they're big numbers, and we know they're big numbers. Uh, but all the things that Jim, I think, is asking are, you know, the things that we need to be aware of as we, as we move ahead and, and be sensitive to how, how the heck the money would ever come about to pay for these things. So much for getting those roads bonded. <laughs> All these other these <laughs> which is what happens every time yeah. roads come in last. Right? Yeah. Mike, is it is what your comment relevant to this? Yeah, it, people have discussed most of the points I was going to bring up. One was Jim's correct that if 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 the requirement is for Northampton to conduct this large regional study, that's very inappropriate. And if we haven't done it, I'd go back to the Corps of Engineers and make sure that's the question they wanted us to answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, before we make sure we really know what they want us to do. And then Jim's point, I think, is, is a very good one. It, it could be that, that the models that we need to look at that establish the water elevation are out there, and we only need to make sure that our levees are higher than what those models say. Well, that's not a big deal, mm -hmm. I don't think. And we have to do the survey anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but then, and then Pat touched on the other thought I had was, if they're handing out this requirement to every community with a flood control system on the Connecticut River, that doesn't make any sense because you can't expect all the communities to do the same thing. So I, clearly we need to do some more legwork, maybe even before we start politicking because mm -hmm. we've, we've got to be absolutely sure we know what we're being asked to do before we complain. Well, we, need, you know, we need to help do that. There's a couple things about the scope as well. I'm, I'm going through uh, I'm going through the core reports and, and some of them, the things that Jim Jim is saying are definitely I mean, it's pretty clear that they're asking us to do these things he's talking about. Some of the other things are, li are a little you know, I want to confirm everything that they're asking us to do because some of it is not as clear as it could be. <coughs> so my my goal after getting a draft of these RFPs done was to send it back to one of my contacts at the core and have them just take a look. Because what I've had to do is go through their documents and try to write a scope that answers the questions that they want answered. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to be responsive to what they're asking us, but they're not always that clear. 
So I've had to evaluate what I think it means and then put it in writing and I'm going to send it back to them to say, did we get it all here? Mm -hmm. And then if there are questions like Mike's <coughs> saying, like what's what's the status of a river model and you know, and these sorts of things, you know, I can ask I can ask those questions before we get too far. And then when we reach the point where um, we know we're going to head down a road of, of significant money, then we should start talking to people that might have access to uh, some funding for us. It, it, it seems, seems to me that the question of the magnitude of a region for a river valley that, that borders several states is clearly something for the core to do, not not for three or four or thirty or forty communities to be stuck with. And I, I wonder why they don't push in that direction without talking about it. So thank you. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Yeah. Are we ready to move on to twenty three? So we'd be glad to come back from Florida and take care of this for us? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I promised Jim I'd work with him. <laughs> and uh, when I get back, I'll pay out of river and you go. You have access to email down there? I can email you. Oh, yeah. I can, I can bury you in work later. <laughs> <laughs> You're out there in the sun, scoring your baseball games. Perfect. Sure. Okay. Do you have another next one? Mm -hmm. Yep. Item 23. This is the Connecticut River 48 inch diameter outfall and old ferry road improvements. Um, the city received $3 million from the transportation bond bill to help fund design for any construction of this project going forward. Uh, we've asked CDM Smith for a scope of services and staff is currently reviewing that. Um, so we expect that that's going to be in design development over the next year at this point. Where's Old Ferry Road? Old Ferry Road runs past Sheldon Field and down to the airport. Oh. Mm -hmm. From Bridge Bridge Road. Bridge Street, excuse me. So in, in terms of the of the expansion plans for the uh, fairgrounds and the need to address the the issues of the Williams Brook uh, that have been I know that you've been involved with, um, is is this going to provide any uh, uh, assistance in terms of the uh, of the problems that that uh, that Ward Three area um, has been experiencing to the extent that it's going to um, uh, provide any, a relief in terms of because uh, I've heard three million dollars was going to be was the amount needed to do that full um, Williams Book project uh, to uh, address the problems that. Uh, of drainage that, that have been existing down there for some time. Is that is it is it in any way related? Is it just is this some is this addressing another problem? I'm just not familiar enough with it. Well, the deal. Well, I know that the Berkshire did a lot of analysis of that, and I'd heard uh, the figure of three million dollars is being uh, suggested at one point. That's probably been increased. I'm sure. It has. Yeah. And the three million dollar number was never, in my opinion, the right number. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it got to be the number, but I don't think we're complaining about a $3 million grant from the bond as Nana mentioned, so we do have $3 million. The 48-inch outfall run from Bridge Street um, all the way down Old Ferry Road, under 91, across the airport to the river. Mm -hmm. The exact location needs to be determined. It'll provide relief to the Lane Street Brook drainage pipe, which mm -hmm. is over capacity and leaking old. Um, so it will improve drainage in that part of the city significantly. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's there, there's a lot of neighborhood drainage from up off of Bridge Street. A lot of neighborhoods comes down that we'll be able to divert into this new pipe and get it up to the Connecticut in this new outfall. It ends up being a very significantly expensive project, and one of the things that we're working on right now is trying to better understand all the costs associated with the pipe and with um, with Old Ferry Road itself, um, it's a large, so it's a 48 inch pipe, it's going to go on Old Ferry Road. There won't be any Old Ferry Road when we get done putting that pipe in. Mm. So we, we have to rebuild the road, right? So um, part of the project, the design project involves full reconstruction of Old Ferry Road, and part of it is to meet um, the future transportation requirements uh, for the fairgrounds for expansion. So there's been some 
traffic studies and things done in the past indicated certain types of improvements were needed for widening of Old Ferry Road, particularly at the intersection. Right. So this um, this project includes those that type of design work that would be done for the road. Um, so that whole area, the drainage will be improved, the transportation aspects <coughs> of it will be improved. Um, there'll be a new water line that will be installed. So one of the things that we're trying to do with, at the moment is is negotiate the final fee with CDM Smith and then start looking at what we have for very uh, preliminary construction estimates mm -hmm. to see where the balance of the money is going to come from. Right. Um, because Chapter 90 money we can use for Old Ferry Road, we can use some stormwater utility money to um, to sort of fill in what the budget's needed for the 48-inch outfall and water enterprise for the water system. But it's a very, very large project, and we need to make sure that all the money is sort of lined up before we yeah. get moving. Uh, the reason I am, I appreciate that that information because it will be helpful. Um, I'm on that I'm on that committee. Uh, the fairgrounds committee that is the development committee and um, and there's a certain school of thought that we're positioning uh, we're better positioned to be able to have access to state to uh, supplemental state funding with Stan's position uh, having been elevated to Stan Rosenberg and uh, and he's been at very actively involved in providing us with the first four million that we got down there to help the, the fairgrounds development a lot of the further development mm -hmm. however is is uh, affected by the inability to be able to resolve the, the drainage issues that you've already described, and uh, to the extent that that uh, um, to the availability, the, the concept of the, that may there may be more availability of funding using the uh, resources that might now be available to us. It's it'll be good to have that number more in hand because that, that has been an, an elusive number to try to get everyone's arms around because it's always been talked about and I think the first it may very well have been if my memory serves me George Andrakides that threw the first number out way back when it was first being discussed as a problem down there but it is a problem it's a real problem and it's one that's that has um, affected that area for decades so I'm, I'm glad to know that we're trying to get our arms around that number because uh, to the extent that any funding options are available that coming our way then that would be what we need to be able to identify to have them put to good use, yep. I think. And that's a big economic benefit to the community if we're able to turn that into a year-round facility down there at the fairgrounds in a way that can uh, uh, provide a, a nice, I think, boost to the uh, overall downtown economy and tax base as well. Right. Hey, next one, item 24, is Clem Street Bridge Analysis. Um, I met with the mayor last week, and he's authorized the capital improvements money to go towards that. We have $50,000 set aside. Okay. So we're using $34,100 the contract with Green and Pedersen to update a long-term plan for the bridge as to where we're going to go. Next one is the catch, water, uh, catch basin to watering facility. It's going to be paid out of the stormwater enterprise funds. Basically, we need a way to uh, be able to bring our catch basin cleanings from the area, dewater them, dry them out a little bit before we take them to a disposal site. So uh, I believe we set aside $60,000 in capital improvements for that work to be done. And lastly was Damon Road uh, reconstruction. We actually met with uh, the state this past week with the mayors about the project and how to move forward. And at this point, the state is seriously considered taking over the entire design and funding of the project uh, and take it off the city's hands. Is that King Street? That would be the intersection. King Street, be part of Bridge Road, King Street intersection, going all the way to about the entrance to the um, uh, the park and ride facility for the bike uh, for the rail trail. It also includes uh, uh, stormwater improvements down underneath Damon Road by the railroad trestle for the rail trail. Includes that work also. If they were to take it over, what kind of timeline are they talking about? Um, don't know yet. Uh, like I said, this conversation happened last week. Yeah, I so feel like that's good news. That's great news. We'll save ourselves some Chapter 90 money and really puts it back in their court. We've been struggling trying to get to 25% public hearing on this for a number of years and mm -hmm. it just can't seem to get there. So um, I'm actually headed down to. This part, not part of the reconstruction, I'm headed down to Boston on Friday with 
uh, Mass DOT to talk to the rail division about signal timing changes on Damon Road to <laughs> hopefully alleviate part of the traffic <laughs> issue down there. That's where that has to go. Uh, yeah, that, that has to go down there. Wow. Boy. <clears throat> so, and that's what we have for current projects. Mike? A couple thoughts came to mind as you're going through this, Ned. Maybe the biggest one is there, there may be 10 construction projects that we see taking place this summer, and that's grouping all the pavement ones together. And and I just question whether we have the staff to oversee all those projects. That is a good question. I know that the, um, the waterline project for Pine Florence Riverbank and Winslow is being contracted out to uh, Bob Nelstrom. We've used successfully on a number of different projects in this in the past as a resident engineer. Number six. Uh, that's correct, number six. But um, even if we hire someone, and, and many of these projects may be covered by the primary inspection, may be covered by a consultant, but it still ends up someone has to make sure. somebody has to watch yeah. watch all aspects of the work just to make sure that it's being done as we expect it to be done. So I just see that as a huge challenge. So that's a lot of projects for one community to undertake in a season and. And I think there are actually more than 10 here. I just, some are going to drop off for one reason or another. It's a significant effort, and I appreciate you seeing that that's the case. Um, because every project, even when we hire a consultant, ends up, we end up needing to have uh, one of our engineers in house managing the contract with the consultant and then managing the contract with the contractor. And these are the bigger ones that we do, the bigger dollar projects we tend to do this way. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a challenge. Uh, and then when you look at the paving project, we, we do all that inspection in-house and contract admin in-house. So other than myself, Dave Valletta and Ann Prevere have um, experience in managing consultants and contracts. I rely on them a lot to help me. Um, and then some of the ones like the dam project and the retain river road retain wall, some of the, the ones at the treatment plant um, fall on my shoulders more, um, which which is the difficulty really in making sure we can keep everything moving. So these IRPs, some of these projects that Ned listed, the flood control pump station, the levee project, the uh, Connecticut River Road Fall. The sludge thickener building at the at the wastewater plant. These projects I can't move. I've been having a problem getting getting them to move because I just don't have the time. So we've talked about this in in previous meetings. Um, but once the summer starts, it'll be you know everyone's going to be straight up going crazy. Um, and we try to do a great job, and we try not to make sure you know we don't want to let any balls fall. But we get stretched really thin with the amount of work that we have there. Um, and a little bit a little bit it's still it's a it's a little bit up in the air. We don't know exactly when some of these are in the hit, but it, it is. It's a lot of projects for the city. Yeah. And and to Mike's point, um just because I wasn't uh, I don't remember being part of the budgetary <coughs> discussions for this uh, stormwater management fee, but what what per, what part of that uh, budget um, uh, was personnel cost? Yeah, well, rather than give me a number or a percentage, I'm, I'm just I'm so I by that response I'm to understand that there was some. Where where or, or not yeah, not significant? It was about a quarter probably. All right, so so and, and that's spread out over the the department. I mean, what I'm I guess getting at is is there are there any uh, funds available from within that um, budget? to provide for, uh, are you already anticipating adding some personnel as a result of that added responsibility what comes uh, with projects related to that? We didn't staff up as, we didn't staff up with this year no. under that new utility and it raises a really good question because I think we need, we staffed up on the operational side, mm. but we didn't staff up on the, on the professional side and there's a gap there's a gap there because the, the added work that's come in has landed on my desk. 
-hmm. And there's not a lot of work. There's not a lot of room on my desk for the added work. Mm -hmm. that, 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 no that, room that's, on your desk. That's, that's, that's come in. So give him a bigger desk. Um, a bigger plate. So there was definitely a need there to look at how we're organized and whether we need more professional staff. Um, I was at a conference a couple of months ago down in Mystic and I was talking to someone from Newton who manages their stormwater utility and she said when their stormwater utility first got approved, one of the first things they did to hire like two other professional people to manage what needed to be done in the utility. Wow. And we actually haven't done that. We've been stressing Doug McDonald out. And he's been doing the work of about three people and I've been, tr I've been trying to do additional work on it, but we haven't kept everything moving. Yeah. And I think um, when you look at the amount of work that we have, um, we, we have to be cognizant of our ability to manage it well for the city. Um, and we haven't talked about, we talked about this year and what you can see here, but there's a lot of other projects at the wastewater plant, other water related projects that need to happen. Right. Well, again, to Mike's point, I mean, if we're going to be, if we're in a position to be able to have the number of projects that we are talking about on this list, and we suddenly find ourselves as a community with the stormwater management um, uh, concept being approved and the funds being being uh, developed to uh, fund that, it would seem as though uh, an internal analysis to be able to see where that where responsibilities could be shifted because. You know, there's, it's all important, and, and, and no one knows better than you guys uh, where the stress comes within your own st staffing, and house staffing. Um, it, probably uh, owe it to yourself to try to figure out how that can be properly dispersed so as to, you know, not overload one end of the, of the uh, on the construction end uh, at the expense of something else. Just, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm... I'm not speaking from any direct knowledge, so I'm, I'd be relying on your advice. But I think it's a point well taken. I mean, because uh, you know, there's nothing worse for the department to have to endure is the criticism that comes from the public for something that isn't managed well, or that is an obvious oversight. Be and if that's due in any way to to uh, understaffing, then we only have ourselves to blame. If that's if that's the case, and that's in the public eye, you get that. I I, I certainly am familiar with it, you know. So I I, I think it's something that uh, I think his point is really uh, on target would be. And the timing that is perfect because in the next few weeks we're going to be tying down budget mm -hmm. to personnel. Yeah. So. Yeah. So maybe you're thinking about it already, but yeah. it just seems to me as though it's something that we gotta advise on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that would be maybe only if we're asked to, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so, any more on the engineering project? Thank you for that great presentation. That was really very helpful. That was very wonderful. Yeah. Um, Although it took more than I know. <laughs> Who um, came up with that number? <laughs> but we don't. But we don't have a lot of business to do. No, I like any home early. Right. Yeah. That Thank doesn't mean so we have to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. Enjoy. Let's see. Okay. Good night. Good to see you, Joe. Good night. Um, discussion of the role of the commission. You know, my <laughs> comment about this is you don't even know how to structure it. But you might have some ideas on how to structure it. I mean, we don't have subtopics. We don't have... Um, <coughs> focus is okay. Yeah. Anybody have? Uh, where did we leave off? Because we started the class in December. Yeah. I think he started off by just setting up the general rules of the meeting with public comment first yeah. and how yeah. it was going to be run, and yeah. that was about all that was undertaken at that point. Well, how about I'm just going to throw this out, but you got we come up with at least some general talking. One of the one we already have on the table is like. Who determines what the advisory role, what, where it comes from, or where it's going? I mean, uh, does it come from? Do you ask us? Do we ask you? Is it the mayor? Is it the public? What, Pat? That's Mike's point. I mean, I think that's the I think, that's the, I think <laughs> that's the key question. Yeah, that's I mean, the key it seems question. like that's the first one. And and um, you know, it was explained to us that it was almost business as usual except we had no authority but <laughs> I don't, that's hard to reconcile that and um, 
you know, just just the concept of being advisory, um, not having any voting authority. Just it strikes me that um, we we take on a very different role, mm -hmm. and and I think we're all willing to participate if to whatever level we're asked to. Right. But um, I, I don't think it it gets generated here anymore. The other concern that I have, just to pile on here, um, is that when you're in any type of group and you have the responsibilities you have, there is no limit to what can be done. So it, previously we could ask staff about things, but we d we've already just discussed about all the rules and responsibilities that you have. Asking for more work to help us be an advisory committee, that's suspect. Uh, or vice versa. Um, if we aren't able to ask, that, does that mean we come in and do research ourselves? If we're to, if the advice flows the other direction, so that, you know, we don't want to make more work for staff, but at the same time, if, if we're to be an advisory um, support, then we have to have some direction for which what, what we're doing. I will speak. Jim, speak. Okay. Um, I will speak for myself. Um, when I work, people that know me, when I work, I like to get as much input on anything that I work on. It's like what you do as a, as a reasonable manager, right? You get all the information, and then you use it in decision making. It's a pretty basic concept. Um, I would like to work with the commission in that way, even if even if you raise things that um, we may not be working on, or I, I may not be working on, or particularly focused on, because I, you know, I've, I've respected the things that the, <coughs> that the board has raised and wanted to talk to us about in the past, and I find that essentially there, I find some validity in everything that comes up. Um, I think the difficulty becomes um, because we work in an administration. So the difficulty becomes the commission taking an initiative on something that's not aligned with the administration. That's the difficulty. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were to ask the mayor, he would probably say that that, that would be, he would want to know what we're doing, like at the commission meetings, and then Ned has his regular meetings with the mayor, tell him what the commission's up to. Um, I'm not a political person, and I, I like input from everybody about anything because I find I'm able to find some value in it. Um, so I hate to think that that won't, that we can't get that. You know what I mean? Even if it causes us to do a little bit more work on something we may not be that focused on at the moment. A lot of great ideas. I mean, you know, a very smart group of people here. A lot of great ideas come out on things that we may be too buried in the sand to think about in any given day. I find that all to be tremendously useful. Um, and I would like to think that 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 would exist. Um, I think if we were going to take any significant uh, public effort to raise the awareness of something, whether it's the wastewater treatment plant or a water transmission main or cutting down red pine or paving the streets or needing more funding for any of it, that whatever role we ask the commission to help us with would be aligned with what um, you know the goals of, of the administration are. It only seems to make sense for that. That seems to be um, one of the problems that the mayor was, I think, um, trying to wrestle with in a fair way when he looked at reorganizing the board, which was um, you have different arms of, you had sort of the board doing some things. It's conceivable that those things could have been different with the ma than what the mayor was asking us to do. So we, we meet with the board and we may do something and then the mayor may find out about it in the past and not have been exactly aligned with what we were doing. That's a little problematic, probably within the city. So we, you know, try to fix that. Um, what I think, in terms of uh, stewardship for infrastructure and the need to spend money and the need to raise awareness of the amount of money, whether we, the money is made available or not. <coughs> One of the biggest things in this, prof in this profession that, that I'm in is raising awareness, whether it's a water system, a wastewater system, a roadway, you know, whatever, flood control. Whatever it is, a lot of it is just raising awareness for funding sources and the people that might end up having to pay a fee or a tax or something to pay for something.
to describe the need for it um, so that people can understand it and you can have an intelligent conversation within the community so you just don't complain about something you can say well you could fix that but it would cost you this much so then figure out whether you know is that really achievable in Northampton and is there sources of funding would that work or, or not but you need the information it's a little bit about what Pat was saying at the beginning talk about paving and you could do some bonding but how <coughs> much you know how much do you need to do so a lot of those are important questions that I you know having the voices of the Commission work on on those sorts of things to me are uh, what I envision being the most important role of the Commission and when we start talking about this comprehensive wastewater plan shortly with you I mean some of these some of the board members have been working on that you'll see what I mean I mean it's a mind-boggling amount of expense so there needs to be a communication about that. Well, why do we even need it? What's wrong with our treatment plan? We haven't heard anything about any of this stuff. And how come you need 30 or 40 million dollars of the sewer system? What's the story there? Or for King Street Brook, or you know, what about that flooding? Oh, you need money to fix that, or the, the pump station? You could go on and on. So a lot of it has to, a lot of it has to do with educating the public about what the issues are within the community and the ability to pay. Um, because it all has impacts on rates or taxes or it, it has to do with a, a service that doesn't meet expectations in which case people need to know why that why that happens so there's a, a great deal of communication that needs to happen and I feel like we're getting a little better at it I don't think we're I think we, we continue to do better it's important to the mayor I know and <coughs> you know Terry since he's been chair um, you know he's, he's constantly picking up the phone suggesting ways to try to communicate better. Ro mentioned that the paving list last year. I mean a lot of that <coughs> you know it was that was you know a lot of it was Terry and the board saying, you know, what what are we doing and why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. We hadn't done that before. We had no I didn't pull out the I didn't pull out the letter from last from two years ago and change a few street names. We had no letter. Mm -hmm. We had no memorandum. We just we had roads we did, used the database and you know we did what we did, but we didn't explain what we did. And explaining what we do or what we don't do or what we need to do is hugely important. And, and I think that's a really important role of the commission. So. You know, um, I mean, in the short clips of time since I've been doing this again, I, I, I don't, you know, other than the signing of contracts, I don't see these meetings being really any different uh, than, uh, than what they were before we were a commission. And I don't pretend to understand uh, exactly how we should operate as a commission. I guess we got to feel our way along. I think what comes to mind with me is that uh, back in the 90s when Ed reform was passed in the state and the uh, school committee was supposed to start acting in a very different way vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with the school superintendent uh, in, in terms of distribution of authority and responsibility. Um, happened to be on the city council at the time and I was very enthusiastic about that because I thought that it was something that needed to be, to be <coughs> done. I thought that the power to manage a school system needed to be vested more uh, specifically in the hands of the superintendent and the principals rather than um, in the hands of a board, uh, albeit elected board. So I was happy to see that that happened. At the same time, uh, after observing it for a while, I, I, I really thought that really nothing changed in many ways. Uh, and, and uh, spoke on two different occasions to the school committee about that concern that I had. What I'm suggesting is that transition when you're doing something, when you're used to doing something some way, transitioning to something different can, can take time just mm -hmm. because people don't know anything other than that. Um, and uh, there'll be transition that'll be taking place with different members sitting in these positions and, and there'll be different people in, in the positions no doubt at some point that, that you folks hold. So it's better for us to come up with something that fits in a generic way as a responsibility for that we can all kind of agree on and, 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 and get some, some feedback from the mayor as to, if, to see if that's what he envisions because ultimately um, it could all just be between you and him. We could just be here in a, in a way that keeps us generally informed maybe if you want to keep us informed. For me, it's all about going over a list like this because I'm on here to be better informed. I want to be able to know what's going on. 
it, it's important to me in the business that I'm in and it's important to me just because that's always how I've operated. I prefer being informed. So uh, for us to go forward in an effective way, however, so that you don't spend an extra hour and a half on, on, a, uh, on every other Wednesday having to retrace your steps with us, if that's not what is intended, then we need to, to understand that better ourselves. We're, we're gonna, we'll have this continuous discussion, I think, every month if we don't get some better direction from above coming down. So maybe that's the way to approach it. And maybe, otherwise, I think we're, we're, we're kind of deluding ourselves to think that maybe this is what we should be doing when really we should be doing something differently if we're going to be doing it effectively and, and so that we don't present some added responsibility or requirement on your part to do something to interrelate with us that you really don't have to do uh, to fit the the requirements of the mayor because it all lies with that whoever is in that that position and it could change in four years when you know when someone else comes in there and they may very well have a different idea how they want to approach it but for the time being if we're going to not make it an added burden for you then we probably ought to hear from him and that would be a discussion that maybe you guys could have with him if you want to include some of us with Roe or, or Terry or whatever to, to be able to, you know, because we've all talked with him, or at least I've talked with him, and I think many of you have talked with the mayor, and uh, he's, I'm not sure if he's, you know, got a absolutely clear idea, but we got to figure out some way of going forward because we're just going to keep on talking about it otherwise. Right, and it will get so massive or nothing. Yeah. And Jake, Lynn, and I keep on thinking this change with Tom was prompted by something, I know it was the charter, but you know, what do we want to see this change be for us mm -hmm. and for the department? And mm -hmm. I think that that's what I keep on looking at. You know, part of me wants to be able to step back and say, what kind of city uh, infrastructure are we shepherding mm -hmm. and stewarding for the future generations? And that, and to be able to shift back and take more of a planning perspective and a bigger picture. But these guys are, you know, I look at the work that they do. I mean, the, you know, the number of, discrete projects that they're running. How can they, you know, how can they step back and think about that big stuff when they've got RFPs to get out and contracts to get signed and inspections to do? And I think that, that we actually might have the luxury of doing that in a broader way, and that's that's what I hope to see. But, you know, that, is, that does beg the question still. You know, what, why was this change implemented and what's the hope? But how do we affect it so it makes it better for what we hope and the service that we provide to our, our not just our current generation, but the ones coming up behind. No guidebook provided with the change. <laughs> well, one, I, I agree with, I want to summarize it in just a minute, but I want to say one more thing, which is we work together very well as a board, I think, when we were a board on the private roads. <coughs> Mike, you had a lot of leadership there. It was really great. We talked a lot about it. But we, it was a very functional aspect, and I like to think that it was helpful to staff some of the work that we did. And who, knew, who even knew that we'd ever get past that? So what I'm hearing from Pat and everybody is that you need to go to the mayor and say, can you give us a little direction on this and come back to us? But we'll know that we're willing to um, take this in another discussion. We just don't want to have this discussion every single meeting. Yep. Yeah. Is that summarizing it? Perfect. You don't want to disperse me? All I do is French. <laughs> okay, so we have a little bit more direction for next time. Um, so, yes. Oh, are we still meeting the second and fourth Wednesdays? Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, yes, that was close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, reserve for topics the chair did not reasonably anticipate. Okay, nothing there. Um, reuse Center, let me summarize that real quickly and David step in. Um, first, I wanted to say in a minor way that. Um, these, you all got in your uh, packet of schedule of events that even though there will be a, a recenter opening, there are still some events that the reuse committee felt was important to continue. I am totally uh, supportive of this because we have now a four or five year precedence in this. So I think the community is um, uh, anticipating these events, saving up stuff, keeping them out of the landfill. This is a really good. These events are, are reflect uh, our community, brings our community together, and also a very um, uh, uh, limited basis. A, a specific topic that the Reuse Center wanted to have the input from the um, commission on, and um, 
I think we talked about it vaguely. We said it's going to be Ned's decision, but Ned has said he wants to know, he wants to make sure that <coughs> the com that the commission is supportive. The issue is access strategy to the reuse center. Right now, and we sort of touched on it, but I'm just going to summarize it one more time. And Ned wants to have our, am I understanding this correctly? Before he makes a decision, he wants to make sure that the board. And the issue is that people with, with transfer station stickers, no problem, uh, but there would be a special annual recenter sticker for non city residents, um, and this would be $10 um, for people that. Um, aren't able to afford that, there would still be the means test like we have for the regular um, um, stickers. Um, the um, uh, and stickers for bicycles will be free. And so, and David. There's al also a provision for someone to have, if they have two cars, could have two stickers, but they would each, each sticker would be $10. It is the end. The question was, is that something Ned was aware of? Or I wasn't aware of a second vehicle pass. Well, how are you going to deal with that? Let me just read this out loud. The committee voted to support the creation of a new annual recenter sticker for non sticker for non city residents and those who don't need a full transfer station sticker. Cool. So you already, if you already have a transfer station sticker, it's not an issue. So this is mostly non-city residents or someone that doesn't have a transfer station. So, like for instance, I don't have a transfer station sticker, but I could buy a reuse center sticker. The it's a ten dollar is a recommended fee, and it would be based the same as the other stickers, July through June. It will give people access to the recenter and only bulky waste disposal. Although there'll still be fees for bulky waste disposal on top of that sticker. It's just a membership fee essentially is what they're they're uh, calling. Uh, I'm not aware of the membership. <laughs> the con it's a concept. concept. It's a yes. concept. Yeah. Yeah. Because part of the process of this is that they bring something in that they want to think they want to reuse, and staff thinks it's not going to be able to reuse, so that they need to pay a disposal fee to get rid of it. That's right. There. That's right. right. And we've spent right. the committee has been spending a lot of time deciding like what can be taken to other places what can be disposed of, but all the disposal fees would be paid up front by anybody bringing items in to protect um, the, uh, to, uh, because from the very beginning, one of the concerns with the DBW was having flocked and jets in, sitting there and not, and not being able to get rid of it. So if they pay the disposal fees up front, then that, if it could be reused, great. If not, the disposal fees have already been paid. And, and the no cash. The, the volunteers would not be handling cash. That would be all in the hands of the gatekeepers. That's correct. All of the fees. <coughs> so, so there's no change in the responsibility for money. Is there a sense that there are a large number of people that would like these stickers? Or is it, this is I don't think that there's any sense at all about yeah. that. And yeah. in fact, it's it's a it's an issue of con. One of the in the. I've been going to a couple of the subcommittee meetings, and there's a there's issues of like we have no idea, and so there's concepts of maybe phase in mm -hmm. until we get an idea of what the demand is. We don't know. No, mm -hmm. but w but Ned is wanting us to advise him on um, a recenter sticker fee and um, for non-residents and. So, if anybody have comments or feelings about that? Well, the idea of opening up to uh, people outside of North Hampton, I think, gives it a lot more, uh, will make it a much more robust center. So, I think there's there's that positive way. If we're going to encourage this event, this center to be successful, I think the more activity they have, the more merchandise or products or items that move through it, the healthier it'll be. So I actually like the concept. Was there thought of no fee? Stickers with no fee? There was. But the idea of the idea of like buying into David, you might want to speak to this. Buying yeah. into membership or buying into being participating in this. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't, there, there <coughs> wasn't a strong feeling for no fee. Okay. And there was a feeling that there should be some fee. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm happy with this $10 compromise. And, and for the first year, we're going to try and create the stickers so that people who come in in May and June are getting an extra two months the so year plus the front whatever front end. Oh, that makes sense. I'm comfortable with it. And I think if people who participate in this, I mean, the $10 fee is probably not going to be there. It seems like it's more valuable than that people are willing to pay a little bit more to participate in the sustainable type effort. And it's not like you can't, we can't backtrack from it either. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a uh, place on a Cape where we get a <coughs> sticker for $25, $45, and the second one's 180 For, for what? For a second car. For to do, to for do, to trash do what? For trash disposal? Trash. Right. So for the convenience, you get to pay more. Just all your trash. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we use one. <laughs> <laughs> Careful. So, yeah, it gets assigned to somebody. Would you like a motion? We need a motion. Yes, we do. Motion. All right. We need a motion. Like to make a motion. Don't we go around? Do we go motion? around yet? No. Oh, oh. You guys are so in such a hurry to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> We've used up our five minutes on this one. So. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. All right. Do you have motion. some? Oh, oh, I don't know. I think Jim has I think he means the final go around. You know the one we do two minutes before we leave. We still have to. So we have to vote on this. Right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about voting on this. Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh. oh, I'm the one that's thinking about leaving. Yeah. 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 I think we're all thinking about leaving. Yeah. We're all thinking about Plus dinner. So is there a motion to approve that? Not yet. I'm so moved that we approve that. Second. Second. Okay. Yeah. All those Order in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Make sure you get that word for word. I want my motion word for word. We approved that sticker system thing. So private ways, Karen Sinkwitz is here earlier tonight, and I'm not sure why she was here because I sent her an email that this had all been resolved on Bottoms Road. I saw her. I ran into her. I was coming in. I said, it's all set up. I so, said, yeah. so basically, we're looking at what we call option four. It actually is a turnaround on one of the first properties coming into Bottoms Road, substantially far away from the Brickman uh, Herman uh, property. Uh, but all parties, all letters there agree that this is an okay location. Uh, there's threatening letters sent that we're going to sue if you do this and do that. So, anyhow, I think it's it's not that everyone's perfect liking, but yeah. everyone has agreed to it yeah. that they're okay with it. So. Yeah. With that, we'll move the plans to the surveyor and get an order of taking and get this one in the hopper, like cool. all the others. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll do it right there. Yes. Oh, okay. Is that relevant? Okay. Cool. Yeah. You want to share yes. that with all of us? Yes, I'm glad to get one for both. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. I just got them. I just got them. Just got them within the last month. So I'll get one for everybody. Where are they? I'll bring one. I'll bring one in. They're great because they've got a little stylus which you can use for your, for your, where is it here? For your, uh, you know. And some stylus still doesn't work, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, that works. You can use, then you can have gloves. Light on oh, the end. Oh, cool. That's a handy pen. I'm going to tell Barry he needs to yeah. show yeah. you yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is that worth more than 50 bucks? We can't. No, no. <laughs> stuff can't no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> real good deal. I'll bring some in the next meeting. Is it more advisory commission? Um, that's it. That's your comment? That's all I got. All right. Like I want to know who fixed the table. This is great. I've been looking at scotch tape holding the laminate on here forever. Dennis Lovato. Dennis Lovato spent well, some time in here. Thank you, Forrest. Well, yeah, he also took I, I'm afraid it's been fixed for a long time and I just <laughs> noticed. But he he also took out the heater air conditioners in yeah. here, the old yeah. ones that were yeah. in We have so much in our room for all yeah. our public Very meetings. Very nice. Yep. Thank you. you did a great job. Welcome to the luxury. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I was picking away. It took you thing. about yeah. six yeah. months to notice it. Oh, oh we're done. Oh. <laughs> I want to go on. Rosemary. Yes. <laughs> I was in Boston on Monday at the annual New England Water Environment Association meeting. It's like a big um, professional meeting every January. And um, 
I was participating in a stormwater committee, which is one of the committees that um, that NUIA has, and I took Doug McDonald with me as a surprise um, on Monday because I nominated him for the Golden Raindrop Award, which is, <laughs> which is awarded to a person who has made notable contributions in the stormwater field in the previous year. So I nominated him, and his name went in with a bunch of other nominations, and the committee uh, evaluated them and voted uh, him the award. So we went in Monday, and he got the award, which was just, yeah, it was Very really, nice. it was really yeah. amazing. Well yeah. deserved. Yeah, it was really nice. And not only that, that's an invaluable way to keep staff happy. It was amazing. That's so he got, his, he got a special pin as an inductee into this Golden Raindrop Hall of Fame, and then he got a, he got a plaque. And then um, I had told a couple of people in the office that he was getting this award because I had a meeting at the, the uh, Northampton Historic Commission last night that I couldn't make, or on Monday, I couldn't make it because I was going to Boston. So I asked Nicole Stanford to cover the meeting for me. So she was aware of it. So when she came into work this morning, her and Diane Rossini, one of the engineers in engineering, they came in early and did up his office. They did this big sign that says Office of the Golden Rain Drive. <laughs> <laughs> All these things. So yeah. it was really sweet. The, st the, so the staff were really great. Um, great. Tease and Doug about his award. So um, okay. anyway, that's what I wanted to tell you about. So you're going to write great. a press release and get it in the Gazette? I have written a press release. I'm trying to get a, a copy of the photograph of him receiving the award oh. on Boston. So I'm waiting for that to come, and yeah, we'll get we'll get it out there. So, yeah. <laughs> EJ, I'm good. Thank you, and I didn't need him. Yeah. <laughs> MJ, uh, did I read in the paper that we hired Susan Waite full time? No. No. Okay. She left Amherst. Mm -hmm. She's left Amherst. And so she's with us? She is with us on uh, part time status. Uh, okay. She doesn't want to be full time until the daughter graduates from high school, which is another year away, okay. year and a half away. So uh, she's oh. working for us. In the same way that she has been. Yes. So far, yes. Okay. And she's no, but I was, the way I was reading the article, no. it made it sound like yeah, she I wrote her an email. It took she's a while yeah. to get into the article yeah. to figure she's out. She's 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 it it sounded knows. like she was coming on full time. Yeah, right no, it did. That's what you don't know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. absolutely yeah. fabulous. I mean, you maybe you do, but for yeah. those, yeah, okay, good. All right. I didn't. Anyways, that was really. You pleased. can tell me. <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, she's wonderful, but it's also been a huge. Advantage for City of North Hampton. Yep. I'm happy to. I'm happy too. Well, we adjourn. Thanks.